Hello, today I'm going to tell you about Bayesian fusion, which is a method for combining distributed Bayesian inferences from different sources into a single combined posterior summary. This is joint work with Hongsheng Dai at the University of Essex, Murray Pollock at the um, uh, Newcastle University, and myself. So this is an overview. I'll first of all give a background motivation into the problem. I'll then go on and introduce the Monte Carlo fusion algorithm, which was the original idea which um, motivated and inspired the Bayesian fusion algorithm, which I'll then go on to describe in more detail. Um, I'll finish the talk with some new directions um, and things that we're hoping to do in the near future as part of the fusion project. Some of this work has already appeared, um, a, a paper in 2019 in JAP, um, Monte Carlo Fusion, and um, a preprint on the more recent Bayesian fusion work is uh, currently available, also referenced at the back, um, and uh, there's a rather preliminary version and more updated versions will be available very soon. So with it, we're in the context of divide and conquer. Um, and the situation is, is that we have different data sets um, sitting on different computers, on se separate cores, as we'll call them. We're interested in carrying out uh, separate inferences, um, sometimes calling them sub-posterior distributions on each core, and then combining these inferences on motivation could be perhaps uh, the sheer size of the data making it impossible to uh, hold all the data on one computer um, and another motivation which is particularly interesting to us is that of um, inference and the privacy or confidentiality constraints where it's just not legally possible to hold all the data within a, a single uh, database So the idea is, is that we want to combine these inferences from these different cores. And the problem is, is that pretty much all existing methods involve some kind of approximation. And um, in addition to that, I mean, the errors induced in such approximations may, may well be small, but they could also be uh, uh, significant and they're not well understood th theoretically. So our motivation is to see if we can uh, develop an exact method for combining inferences. And I'll, define, I'll, I'll uh, describe that in, in a bit more um, mathematical detail now. So we're in a Bayesian setting. F is a, a, a distribution of interest, a posterior of interest. And this decomposes as some product over capital C cores of densities F, C, X. And we assume that we can draw samples from a density proportional to FC, but we cannot do the same for F. But we still wish to somehow obtain samples from F from these um, sub-posterior samples. So many uh, uh, useful methods have been proposed in the literature. Perhaps the, uh, the most well-known one is the consensus Monte Carlo method of Scott in 2016. And this method is exact um, in the case where uh, all the FCs are, are Gaussian. Um, but an, uh, the error induced by it uh, can be quite substantial in cases where, where the, the model is not, not a um, um, simple Gaussian one. So we begin our search for an exact method by um, introducing an auxiliary variable um, representation for this distribution. So we start off with Fy, which is a distribution um, on R to the D. And we're going to expand this distribution um, by introducing auxiliary variables X1 up to Xc, where remember capital C is the number of cores, where this auxiliary density has um, uh, has the density given in, in the red equation one there. 
And what's the point about that density? Well, the point will be that the marginal distribution of y for that particular density is equal to f. So let's examine g slightly more closely. So g is a, a density on uh, c d plus one dimensional uh, space. Um, the terms inside the product there are um, terms which are familiar like uh, fc squared xc divided by fcy. But also something which we haven't introduced yet, which is um, uh, a mysterious object, PCY given XC, where PC is just the transition density of any Markov chain or Markov process which has stationary distribution FC squared. Now, it may seem a little bit odd that we have FC squared in there and not FC, uh, but that's the way the algebra works out um, to uh, ensure that this thing has. Um, the correct marginal distribution for y. So there's substantial flexibility in choosing PC here. And uh, we could look at different uh, options for this. Um, but the one which uh, we've used um, uh, essentially through, through um, most of this work for, for reasons which uh, will become clear later to do with the implementation is the double Langevin diffusion. Um, the double Langevin diffusion is a diffusion which satisfies a stochastic differential equation given in the middle of the page there. Um, dx is equal to grad log fc dt plus uh, Brownian motion. Uh, and it's called double Langevin because it's invariant distribution is fc squared. So unlike the standard Langevin, diffusion, there isn't a half in front of a drift term. Now, this is a Langevin diffusion. It's, uh, um, uh, it, it may seem an odd choice if you consider that actually the transition density of a Langevin diffusion is almost always itself not tractable. So this doesn't allow us to write down explicitly uh, the density G from the previous page. Nevertheless, this turns out to be natural for, um, for reasons which we'll go on to look at. Okay, so just as a reminder, we have our uh, density for G, which is um, given in red there. And we, you, we're going to use, a, a, um, we're first of all going to introduce the Monte Carlo fusion algorithm as a rejection sampling algorithm by sampling from something uh, which is a little bit more um, uh, sort of user friendly to simulate from. So the density H at the bottom is given by the product of these FC random variables multiplied by uh, a Gaussian-like term for y centered about x bar, where x bar is just the mean of the x values. Now note in this that we do actually have um, a tuning parameter for h, uh, capital T here. And this tuning parameter is something which will become very important and one which we'll have to choose carefully in order to optimize the efficiency of the algorithm. But just to show you a little bit more, so this is the H density. I've shown it again at the top of the screen. Uh, it's, it's clearly very easy under the assumptions of the uh, scenario that we're in to simulate from H, because all we need to do is to draw uh, XC from FC for each of the um, X1 up to XC. And then compute the mean of these values, X bar, and then finally, just to simulate um, y to be some Gaussian perturbation about the average values of these x's. So there are other choices that we could take for h, and some discussion of this, and uh, at least one is implemented in uh, substantially more detail in the papers. But for this talk, we'll just concentrate on this particular choice of h.
So if we think about using H as a rejection sampling, uh, in, in a, a rejection sampling algorithm in order to simulate from G, um, it turns out that we can write down the accept reject ratio as the product of two terms written in red there, rho times Q. And rho and Q turn out to be separate numbers which are almost surely less than or equal to one and can therefore be considered as two independent uh, separate rejection steps. So I'll describe these now. So the rho rejection step has a probability of e to the minus, well, it's a term which involves sigma squared, which is the variance of the x's about their um, mean x bar, um, scaled by um, these numbers c over capital T. So this number capital T, which we introduced in H, um, is a tuning parameter that we could use, for instance, to make this probability larger or smaller. Um, for instance, by making T larger, we're gonna be able to make rho um, uh, larger. So that's what happens with rho. The Q rejection step is somewhat more complicated. So Q itself can be written as a product over the capital C terms of uh, terms which I call EC. Now each of the ECs is given by the exponential of an integral over the time period between zero and T. And this is an integral of a functional of a Brownian bridge tied down to start off at XC and to finish at this common point Y. And the function inside the integrand is um, a function which turns out to be something that we can get directly from the FC function as a Laplacian of FC divided by FC. And the capital Phi FC, Phi, phi Cs here are just um, constants chosen in order to ensure that these integrands are non-negative so that um, each of the terms in Q is less than or equal to one and that means that we can actually interpret Q as capital C independent, um, except reject steps in their own right. So in, e in each of these rejection steps in their own right basically looks like having to have needing to simulate from an event of a probability given by the expression there. But that is a, a standard um, routine that we can do using pass-based rejection sampling, which is a technique that's been around um, for some 15 years now and something that we can routinely apply in this context. So there's quite a lot going on there. So I'll just summarize the Monte Carlo fusion algorithm um, very briefly. We start off with the sub Monte Carlo samples is samples from FC for each value of C equals one up to capital C. Given that we compute the, the mean and, and uh, then a Gaussian perturbation to pr pr produce the proposed value of the endpoint Y. And then following that, uh, we simulate in principle um, Brownian bridges um, in between each of the starting points, uh, X1 up to XC, uh, up until the finishing point Y. And then the whole lot of this is ex accepted with the probability rho times Q, where the rho and Q can correspond to separate reject, uh, rejection sampling steps as we described. And in this row only looks at the C initial points and penalizes the over discrepant starting values. Whereas Q penalizes the trajectories um, according to state dependent uh, hazard rates as we wrote down along the trajectory of the Brownian bridge. So that gives a, a simple um, 
a summary of how the algorithm works, and I'm now going to give an illustrative example. Um, so suppose I have the following density, the density in, written in the middle there, uh, given by F, and I'm, I'm just, uh, it's a, a simple toy example. I'm going to decompose this into the product of five terms um, as written there. And the simulation results that you get using the algorithm in this case uh, are the following. The black curve, which you can't see very well because it's hidden by the blue curve, the black curve is the true density. The blue curve is the, what we get from Monte Carlo fusion. And interestingly, despite the fact that we have a, a fairly nice unimodal density here, the consensus Monte Carlo method uh, gives quite a, a, a substantial bias. That's the one in the red dotted line. But there are limitations of the uh, uh, rejection sampling um, Monte Carlo fusion algorithm. Scalability. Is the first thing. So these acceptance probabilities can be small, especially when the number of cores is large and also when the dimensionality is large. Um, secondly, if T is too small, as we saw, the row rejection step um, can actually have a very, very small acceptance probability. And when T is large, then actually we needed to have uh, these Brownian bridges running over a longer time period and therefore having a much higher probability of rejecting. So that can also lead to problems. And in complicated high dimensional situations, it will often be very difficult to find a T which allows both these rejection steps to be um, acceptable for efficiency. So what we'd like to do in the Bayesian fusion algorithm is to find some way of harnessing the ideas from the Monte Carlo fusion algorithm into a much more scalable and practical algorithm. So a natural thing to do since we have these Brownian bridges over time is to introduce some kind of partition and maybe we can find some way of uh, sequentially uh, doing the simulation. And maybe this can avoid the worst problems of the Q rejection step, which remember has to um, survive uh, with a hazard rate that's running over the Brownian bridges throughout the entire period from zero to T. But one of the big problems with this is, is that the Monte Carlo fusion algorithm is constructed in a non-sequential way. It first of all constructs the starting values at time zero. It then constructs Y from the uh, perturbation around the mean of the X values, which is the endpoint, And then it fills in the middle bits. So this then constructs a non-Gaussian density in a non-sequential way. So it's not natural, it's not obvious how to construct that in a, in a sequential manner. But it turns out so that it's quite easy to fix that because conditional on the starting values, the, uh, the rest of the process is indeed Gaussian. It's just a Gaussian process. We have all these dependent Brownian bridges uh, which are all hitting the same terminal value y. So because of this, we can use multivariate Gaussian uh, calculus to um, reorder the simulation methods and to simulate forward um, so that the endpoint y is not realized until the end of the simulation. And this allows us to put ourselves in the, in the context of an SMC algorithm and to rephrase everything in terms of SMC, in which we have a number of particles running and these particles draw strength from each other by when one particle dies, well, maybe it doesn't die, maybe it's just reweighted and maybe we do uh, the standard SMC ideas of um, reweighting um, uh, when, when we have sample impoverishment at uh, different time points. 
So we do this on a, a discrete time grid. So we have time intervals tj minus one up to tj. And between those two time intervals, uh, we update according to the hazard rate of the Brownian bridges or the dependent Brownian bridges on that time interval. And then with the new weights that we actually have, we can apply a reweighting algorithm. So there's a lot of details behind this, which I'm not going to go into. Um, all the details are available in the paper. There's a lot of tuning parameters. Okay, uh, we need to be able to choose the partition carefully. If we choose the time interval to have a partition where there's too much, um, but where the 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 um, tj minus tj minus one are typically too large, then the um, SMC algorithm will have weights which grow out of control very rapidly. Conversely, if they're too small, then the algorithm will be very slow because it has too many steps. Secondly, the choice of capital T, which is a similar issue to what we had for the Monte Carlo fusion um, algorithm. However, this isn't as serious as for the Monte Carlo fusion algorithm <clears throat> because of the partitioning that we're doing in time. So in other words, we're allowed to actually have much larger time periods, capital T, with a stable algorithm in this context. And we now actually have some um, quite detailed uh, guidance based on a theoretical analysis um, for uh, how to choose these um, these tuning parameters to kind of optimize the performance of the algorithm. So let's give some simple examples of this in action. Um, this is a, a situation I've called them discrepant densities. The situation here um, is that um, we've got um, different, two different um, cores. Um, so capital C is equal to two, and we have densities uh, on each core which are getting further and further apart. Now in red and black, I have two versions of the Monte Carlo fusion algorithm. They're very similar, so I won't describe um, the differences. But you see that both the Monte Carlo fusion options um, have serious uh, problems in uh, running time as the uh, densities sitting on the uh, different cores uh, diverge. Uh, and in contrast, the Bayesian fusion uh, seems to be uh, entirely robust. Another example, I mean, how sensitive might these methods be to um, the, the, um, the number of cores? So here we've, we've looked at uh, an analysis um, uh, of how the running time depends on cores. And again, we see the Monte Carlo fusion options being highly sensitive to the number of cores whereas space infusion algorithm seems to be um, fairly, fairly robust. And in fact, you know, we've done this kind of experiment on, on harder examples for many more cores than this, and we see a, a sort of a, a similar picture. Uh, here's a simple uh, logistic regression example um, in which we've compared our method, um, which is given in blue, and um, uh, there's also the black true density um, in this case, and we've actually compared our analysis to um, two of the competitor algorithms, um, the Weierstrass sampler of Wang and Dunson, and um, the uh, consensus Monte Carlo method, which was described earlier. And we can see that the other methods do give um, bias, substantial bias, um, and uh, the Bayesian fusion model seems to be much closer to the truth. Of course, this comes at, at um, um, so there, there again, you see another example, um, the error, ab integrated absolute error um, for very different simulations is substantially smaller uh, for the, the Bayesian fusion um, than the other methods. And you can see the consensus Monte Carlo really getting quite large as the number of cores is larger. Um, of course, this comes at a cost, and the running time of our Bayesian fusion model 
um, is larger than the other methods. In fact, the consensus Monte Carlo method, which is in black on that particular plot, is substantially cheaper to do. Um, and so that's the cost of, of, of running the Bayesian fusion algorithm. Uh, briefly, just another uh, example. This is a real data example uh, involving um, US Census Bureau data. Um, and this, this example used 40 cores. Um, and you can see here that the error uh, in the consensus Monte Carlo is very substantial, uh, whereas the Weierstrass and, um, uh, does fairly well and uh, the Bayesian fusion model. Uh, better still. And uh, again, we can we can analyze the data as the number of cores increases um, and see as a similar picture as to what we had before. I wanted to um, just say something about where we're going with this fusion work, because <clears throat> there seems to be lots of um, interesting new directions. Um, well, one project we've been looking at involves um, trying to deal with a situation where we might have much uh, very different levels of um, uh, variation on different cores. Perhaps we have very different data set sizes on different cores. And so what we have to do in that context is to choose capital T to be different on those different cores. And so we can actually extend and adapt the entire uh, Bayesian fusion setting um, in order to, to work in, in the following way. So the diagram that we have there basically shows uh, the sort of thing that we have with, with um, the green path running for a much shorter amount of time, for instance, from the red path. And this is joint with uh, Ryan Chan. Um, another thing is, is that when we actually um, combine uh, these densities, there are different strategies for actually doing this combination. So these are so the all the examples that we've given in the paper in the in the talk so far have been uh, uh, the of the sort of um, uh, format on the left hand side, uh, whereas we we have something uh, uh, substantially um, more intricate, such as the hierarchical structure on the right hand side. Um, and this uh, they're, they're definitely interesting kind of questions as to which kind of uh, structure for combining the densities is optimal. And the, the third thing is something which I mentioned briefly uh, earlier on, um, is the Confusion um, project, which is uh, all about um, combining confidential inferences. And this is joint work with Louis Asler. Um, and other things we have been doing, we've been using um, uh, different um, H functions such as uh, on style and back process inspired processes rather than Brownian motion ones. And there are very close connections between these kind of methods and approximations which are like uh, the consensus Monte Carlo algorithm. And there are other interesting connections to Bayesian group decision theory, which I won't go into, and meta analysis, which I won't go into in detail here. So in conclusion, we've introduced Bayesian fusion, which gives a scalable, consistent methodology, uh, which is robust in various different ways. It's not quite exact. We must be uh, clear about that. It's using SMC, so SMC has a finite number of particles. So it's only consistent in the sense that we need the number of particles to go to in infinity, also in order for us to say that um, we have exactness. Although we saw it, as we saw in the examples, um, the errors induced by using this approach are small compared to um, some of its major competitors. We can use the Bayesian fusion uh, methodology to suggest other approximations. And it's interesting that uh, uh, consensus Monte Carlo can be thought of as um, an approximation by simplifying some of the steps in one particular type of Bayesian fusion algorithm. And I haven't talked about it at all today, but we're developing quite a lot of um, theory um, to support the scalability 
of Bayesian fusion um, in different contexts. And that will be presented in the, um, uh, in the uh, preprint of the Bayesian fusion paper um, uh, when it's next updated. Okay, uh, that's, thank you very much for listening. That's the end of my talk. Um, there's some references. Thank you.